Dear Minister, Generals, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to welcome our Federal Minister, Dr. Karin Kneisel. She uh, distinguishes this conference through her presence. We have uh, created a little pilot project and we hope that we can uh, start a process of uh, developing strategy. We are supported by America, Israel, Norway, Sweden. I can't really name everybody, so we are receiving lots of support. This is a kind of strategic community that is emerging here. And this conference is organized for the third time. Now, when we consider the fact that our Minister of Foreign Affairs is present here, so it is good to be perceived. Uh, so we are taking a pioneering role in this field with all modesty. So the minister was here with us, uh, a very prominent guest and rapporteur for the Middle East. She contributed her expertise. She was in high demand and even back then we already saw that this expertise should lead her to higher office and this has now materialized. So, dear Minister, I'd like to ask you to take the floor. A wonderful good morning. Bogatov, Mabuchim Haboin. I would like to thank the commander of the National Defense Academy and I would also like to thank Brigadier Editor-in-Chief Dr. Wolfgang Peichel and also your predecessor, Brigadier Former Editor-in-Chief Andreas Stupka of the Austrian Military Journal. There are a lot of other gentlemen here whom I'm not mentioning, but it is like coming home. It feels like coming home to the National Defense Academy. I have really missed you in the past seven months. I have always loved coming here and I never tired to say time and again during lectures here what I have learned from the presentations, the conversations and how much I owe to this experience. So my book, The Energy Poker, couldn't have been published if my interest had not been awakened in this house. Uh, because I was asked to talk about oil and gas. That was uh, in the year 2000, and that wasn't really uh, considered to be such an important subject. That interest grew in, 20, in 2006 and 2007 in light of the gas crisis. So thank you very much uh, for everything that I have uh, had the privilege of doing, thanks to the National Defense Academy. And when Brigadier Wolfgang Pasch asked me whether I could come here, Markus Reisner then also uh, was highly committed to the idea, so we try to play around with my, uh, well, agenda, but it is possible, and I'm very pleased that I'm here on time today. Now, the subject of my presentation that we thought about, and I've really taken time for this presentation, so this isn't just any old presentation, it was uh, developed jointly, so it's about diplomacy and foreign policy in combination with tactics and strategy, with a question mark. And I will also provide you with the presentation. It is a written text. I prefer normally to speak freely, but for this subject we have a text uh, that your interpreter unfortunately doesn't have. If a foreign minister talks about diplomacy and foreign policy and relates this directly to tactics and strategy, you can guess that diplomacy plays a tactical role and foreign policy plays a strategic role or connotation. But I'd like to emphasize at this point that today I'm neither going to talk about military science nor a diplomatic call for action. In the past few decades, we've, in, well, we've used the term strategy in an almost inflationary way. So this is why I'd like to invite you to talk about strategy and politics or foreign policy based on Raymond Aron, who in the 1960s, in light of the Cold War and the concept of nuclear deterrence, 
dealt with Karl von Clausewitz's work. For the French sociologist and philosopher Raymond Aron, the very topical political and military questions in connection with the decolonialization were of interest that we are now seeing in a completely different environment. We're talking about asymmetrical conflicts or fighting terrorism. In 1969, a study that was only published in 2012 on the topicality of Clausewitz, the original title is Clausewitz et notre temps, published in Etudes Internationales, Quebec, 2012, Raymond Aron found a trend towards an increasing substitution of the concept of politics by strategy. So the concept of strategy was used for any action that is, uh, well, dealing with lots of different options that could be possible. Raymond Aron mentions the continuation of the idea of Clausewitz according to which politics and strategy in the final analysis becomes one. Without wanting to focus on this terminological distinction between the military target and political purpose, I would like to say that Clausewitz, the international or foreign policy, is seen as a societal guardian of all interests towards other countries. Now, if we talk about diplomacy, this essay published in Foreign Affairs of a British diplomat, and I quote, the old diplomacy was based upon the creation of confidence, the acquisition of credit. The modern diplomat must realize that he can no longer rely on the old system of trust. He must accept the fact that his antagonists will not hesitate to falsify facts and fear no shame if their duplicity be exposed. Now, is modern diplomacy completely devoid of any trust? This is, well, a reference to fake news or cyber warfare. Under the title Diplomacy Then and Now, an analysis provided by Sir Harold Nicholson uh, dates back to 1961. And in the context of the Cold War, his opponents, the states of real socialism, were the target. Nicholson believed that he could identify a change in values, a shift of paradigms. A new understanding of international relations favored that. When he entered diplomacy, he had only come to the world of diplomacy before the First World War in 1912, and the foreign policy after 1945 was no longer reserved for a small elite with a comparable background and a common interest in preserving a certain world order. Now, it may come as a surprise that to illustrate the strategic character of foreign policy, I'm using a French philosopher's perspective of a Prussian military theorist of the early 19th century. And somebody who was socialized, a British diplomat who was socialized before the First World War, well, he's uh, used for tactical purposes. But these examples were quoted uh, well, quite consciously because both of these ideologies, I believe, are quite topical nowadays and Terminologically speaking, of course, uh, they could be brushed up and could be put in the context of narrative, cyber, hybridity, and resilience. This takes me to this initial definition of foreign policy in the sense of strategy and diplomacy for tactical implementation. But this perspective of foreign policy and diplomacy, can it be upheld in light of a world situation where well, often you cannot verify reports of what happened during various crises, and the public often believe that foreign policy doesn't shape, but it is driven by various interests. I think this is valid. In light of this circumstance that uh, 
in terms of our ability to act in terms of foreign policy, we are confronted with a lot of uh, impasses or cul de sac in the European Union as well as in the Middle East, in the transatlantic and transpacific relationship, or when it comes to nuclear detente. At the same time, we also need to consider that uh, there are trends uh, too weak in multilateralism. A credible foreign policy, therefore, should focus more on the larger geopolitical context and provide strategies. Decisions should be taken on the basis of uh, knowledge of facts and only after a clear analysis of all the options and the impacts of these options. But it should also have sufficient resources to continue the dialogue and to implement a rules-based approach. We need to focus more than just on the benefit of one's own country. In the case of Austrian foreign policy, what this means is that uh, we need to stand up for the rule of law, for a rule-based international system that provides for commitment in uh, disarmament, humanitarian questions, and Vienna being a hub for this international dialogue, to mention just a few priorities of our foreign policy. Now, I'm not going to talk about the European dimension at this point, quite consciously so, to t focus more on diplomacy in terms of the tactical side, so the implementation of foreign policy. Classical diplomacy well, focuses on this tactical implementation. And, of course, uh, you are going to forgive this diplomat who's become a foreign minister uh, to want to see diplomacy as a constant element of foreign policy. So Harrison uh, well, found a profound change in diplomacy across the world, but the tasks and methods of diplomats, no matter whether we're talking about bilateralism or multilateralism, they remain essentially as before. Of course, the diplomatic service requires a level of specialization. Countries have a dense network of uh, representations, and in multilateral diplomacy, we have international organizations and institutions that are in daily contact. It was different back then when I joined the diplomatic service. So there's an exchange between diplomats and foreign ministers that has increased, and this is often happening in real time. In the past few decades, we've seen a remarkable change in the communication technology world. And still, and I'm firmly convinced of that, there is still a kind of classical diplomacy that resides in the fact of being able to listen, of uh, listening to some nuances and to understand uh, some finely tuned messages and to send them. That presupposes that you speak to people and you listen to them, you put yourselves in tune with them. That means you need to understand the interests and the way of thinking of your counterpart. And that goes beyond the simple knowledge of facts, the legal, the economic and political analysis. I've said this time and again, also yesterday, during uh, presentations given in Geneva, I spoke to the Disarmament Conference and the Human Rights Council in the past seven months of my activity. I found repeatedly, and I also understand our work that way, that it's not about exchanging policy briefing notes and analysis. We've been doing this way too often in the past few months. So it's about uh, talking to people and seeking this conversation. In the day and age of globalization, our world has shrunk, and places that 20 years ago were very distant uh, can now be reached easily. Social media have uh, created an additional public audience, as we know. So we believe, supposedly, that outside of our cultural circle, we know about everything. But has this contributed to a better understanding? We rely on scientific analysis, on expert knowledge. But to listen to other people, to really go to travel to these countries, well, that's quite rare nowadays. And this is why sometimes 
there are serious misjudgments and on the basis of these misjudgments foreign policy concepts are often drawn up. Now if diplomacy restricts itself to confront each other with these analyses, none of the two sides can be convinced and no trust can be built. To convince the other party of one's own point of view without just uh, including the other's point of view is, well, doomed to fail. The importance of personal contacts and relationships remains unchanged, I believe, and to produce that is the most important task of diplomacy. Now, as a little aside, let me add that 20 years ago when I left, there were many reasons why I left the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and one of those was that what was missing was the analytical side, the intellectual challenge. Well, some of my colleagues uh, were a bit upset. There were also party policy reasons. I, I wasn't a member of a party. So there were other reasons why I left. But it was not satisfactory at the intellectual level. And diplomacy has little to do with uh, the intellectual dimension. It's about uh, talking to people, creating the right atmosphere, and then, of course, building on this knowledge and move forward together. To me, a lot of these things, well, I wasn't aware of that. I missed uh, working in this other way, so I felt really well in those past 20 years, and now I'm back. And what I'm trying to do is to make sure that uh, I use talents according to what they can do. And some people are better at doing analysis, and others are simply good at uh, being diplomatic, uh, create the right atmosphere, and uh, going towards the other person. And that's really decisive, and that is something that makes for the Austrian tradition. Now, I would like to talk about some ideas about the EU Council Presidency, which starts on Sunday. A few days prior to our Council Presidency, under the motto of Europe that protects, I would like to talk about our definition of strategy and tactics and give an example based on some priorities of uh, European foreign policy. That's our tactical approach as a EU Council Presidency. So in terms of tactics, of course, uh, we see this as one element of tactical diplomacy. There will be numerous bilateral talks, and we're going to focus in particular on, uh, well, making sure that those who are still hesitant are convinced. I'm talking about the geopolitical vacuum in southeastern Europe in particular. And I have said it time and again in my conversations that I understand why in Paris, in The Hague, and elsewhere people think differently. So it depends on how close you are, how much you are affected, geographically speaking. At the level of strategy, when it comes to establishing foreign policy priorities, I would like to first and foremost point to this region. No vacuum must develop where third parties can penetrate. Historically, at the societal level and in other respects, since the days of Prince Eugene, this region has always had a direct impact, not only on Austria. In the late 90s, I remember that there was hardly a capital that uh, didn't have uh, Balkan experts or Balkan officers. After 9-11, the Balkan experts were dismissed in favor of uh, experts on terrorism. And then this branch knew its heyday. But what we are seeing is that this region is close to us. And demographically speaking, and also at the emotional level, it is closer to us than this is true for, well, northwestern EU countries. The European awareness for the importance of the region has increased since uh, the summit of Saloniki in 2003. We know about the importance of uh, stability, democracy, and prosperity in our neighborhood. This momentum needs to be used, and I've said this time and again in my visits to Sarajevo and other cities, that not when they say you have to help us, well, I said that helping is not a category of diplomacy. We all have our interests, 
We are interested in seeing reforms in this country, and you have interest in developing an EU perspective. So it's about the moment to use this uh, moment of time and this momentum that we've created in all maturity. We know that friendship is not a political category, and I myself also have my reservations when it comes to this fiction of friendship. That's all it is, a fiction. It's about interests. And these interests well, should be foreseeable and predictable and lead to convergence. Other European priorities cover a constructive dialogue with Russia, also in terms of solving the conflict in Ukraine. And the decisive steps, of course, need to be taken by the parties involved. As to our relationship with the eastern partners of the EU, Austria favors the concept of individual as well as uh, multilateral relationships. So we would like to express uh, our concern about the role of Iran and its missile program and also well, the withdrawal of uh, the U.S. Uh, from the Iran deal, the TCPOA. So for this effort, well, it was about uh, preventing a nuclear arms race in the region. And this is where the EU, even after the U.S. withdrew and after the resumption of U.S. sanctions, has to make sure that the economic hopes of Iran are not thwarted. Many things point to this happening, especially since it was declared Nobody could uh, import Iranian oil anymore as of the 4th of November. So this is like uh, breaking their backbone, and this cannot be the solution. So I'm seeing that uh, holding on to this agreement makes sense for many reasons. It's not only about concluding an arms control treaty that has to be adhered to, of course, the international uh, nuclear uh, Atomic Energy Agency is saying that. So I'm seeing this as somebody who was socialized as a legal expert. So it's about security of contracts, about credibility, pacta sunt servanda. Agreements have to be kept. So if this um, agreement falls, there will be consequences. And of course, we might as well stop uh, teaching international law the way we taught it in the past few decades. The Vienna Convention on Contractual Law has been signed in this very city, and I myself also studied Roman law, and I was enthusiastic and passionate about it, and I'm still coined by, well, what makes a contract what it is? It's a signature under an agreement, a tenancy or lease agreement or whatever, or an international treaty, the signature is important and carries uh, legal security and predictability. This European relation to a peaceful future in the Middle East and in parts of Northern Africa also covers the preservation of the possibility of uh, Israel and the Palestinians negotiating a solution. The reactivation of the Geneva talks on Syria and the persecution of uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes. I met with Demistura, the US, UN Special Envoy, who had shown remarkable optimism, and he still keeps on his many interviews with people, and also trying to find a political situation in Yemen and the resumption of unity and stability in Libya. Libya, too, on the 19th of March 2011, was uh, destroyed in the name of humanity. So it can only be in everybody's interest, and I know that these are big announcements, but these little cogwheels keep on turning, especially when we look at Libya. We're only talking about small cogwheels, but last year we managed to, well, re-establish a Libyan Coast Guard. In the beginning of 2016, well, this wasn't to be expected on that scope. Another dominant subject is the question of migration. Last but not least, uh, there's many different uh, demographic developments. And the last UNDP Arab Development Report of, of autumn of 2016, that I always quoted as a teacher last year, says that until 2020, 
60 million people from North Africa and the Middle East will be looking for work. I'm not talking about jobs, they're looking for work in the areas that they've been trained for. And now with the economic developments in Turkey, jobs will be eliminated. And I tirelessly point out that the relatively low oil prices, now in the past year they've gone up again, due to a scarcer offer and the geopolitical changes, but we were far away from the price that we had before 2014, that was more than $100 per barrel. For some years now we've had less than $50 per barrel. Now all of this has led to a situation where workers from Southeast Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, India, no longer found work in the Gulf states. So that doesn't only apply to oil fields, but also the construction industry. Especially in Saudi Arabia in recent years, major construction companies went bankrupt. And a year ago, I said during a conference here, the second biggest group of those who are trying to get from Libya to Italy and Europe are people from Bangladesh. So those are the people who are moving on. It's not Libyans who are migrating, it's people from Southeast Asia. So in this new era, we are uh, moving from a transatlantic to a Pacific era. And people have found out about this now. Now in order to be able to compete with other global actors such as the US, China and other emerging powers in Asia and elsewhere, well, we need to be successful. So it's about a Europe that protects. We need to be competitive, robotization, digitization, artificial intelligence, you name it. All these are subjects where we can tell that within the U28 there are very different starting positions and who can deal with this question in which way. So everybody's preparing for this change and transformation. As you know that the Chinese approach is what we can't uh, innovate ourselves, we just buy. So a lot is being bought and sold. You remember KUKA, the German robotics company. Meanwhile, the European Union has, uh, well, stopped this. Pulled the plug on that, but we're not always up to speed in terms of that. Now, under the Austrian EU Council presidency, we're planning to more efficiently combine Europe and Asia. In my ministry, as I said repeatedly, the EU Council President a good, ne good Neighborhood Policy, my focus was on Asia, on Russia, and a pragmatic way of dealing with Turkey. So open a new page on Turkey and a new chapter. And uh, well, I have been successful in some respects. We'll see how it will play out. Since I'm speaking in this audience here, it's about the comprehensive uh, participation of Austria in the PFP. So I managed to achieve the civilian uh, side with my Turkish coll colleagues. The military dimension is still missing, but I guess that the Austrian side will have to deliver on that. Even in light of unilateralism and import duties, the transatlantic partnership remains important for Europe. And from the economic perspective, it's well, indispensable. It is based on a common cooperation for rule of law and stability. The close cooperation in the fight against organized crime and terrorism also comes in here. Another central element is the weakening of the multilateral system where the EU is increasingly focusing on defense matters and security matters. That was uh, when the ministers of uh, Defense and Security met on Monday, where I had the privilege of representing Austria. Another central element is the already mentioned weakening of this system of multilateralism. Because global challenges such as security policy and climate change require a more global approach. Now at the end I would like to briefly talk about Sir Harold Nicholson and his uh, regret that he voiced in 1961 about this loss of trust in diplomacy in this bipolar world order where one side only focuses on the implementation of the socialist model. In 1989, this world order, as most uh, experts couldn't predict, 
now all of a sudden vanished. Does this require a special reference to the fact that diplomacy well, was not discontinued, was not interrupted at all, and it was a level of continuity in intergovernmental relations. Even though foreign policies may change uh, diametrically opposed, in the diametrically opposed direction, but the toolbox for diplomacy remains the same. And, of course, like Harold Nicholson, you could say foreign policy well, goes away and diplomacy is around to stay. Or, as Anderson said, only the tin soldier didn't believe it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister, for this lecture on diplomacy and foreign policy um, in connection with strategy and tactics. The large number of security developments that you have presented, of course, lead to challenges in foreign policy. And uh, as you, Federal Minister, pointed out, the location Vienna is an international place where um, focuses are being sharpened. And uh, with a view to the future presidency of Austria, there is a clear direction toward to paying attention to the developments in the Balkans and leading a constructive dialogue with Eastern Europe and Russia uh, with all the problems that exist. And you also referred to Asia, your Asia focus, and many more points were outlined by you. And the security of treaties you also addressed as an important element of stabilization. And uh, this is, of course, the rule of law. It's the basis of all this. Thank you so much for this lecture. Uh, we do have time now for a Q&A session, and times for uh, there is time for questions here at LAVAC, too. Um, actually, and this is one of our aims, it's the only conference of its kind in the German-speaking world, and it serves as a platform for an overall um, a platform f um, in the German-speaking world. And we tried as such to make a contribution to strategic acting. It's not just a group of experts discussing topics, but we want to provide an input to for decision makers. And uh, there is a mic going around. Please use a mic. First question is already up there. Just a moment. <clears throat> The minister, it is a great honor for me. Uh, four years ago, uh, I actually listened to a great lecture of yours, and uh, I still remember it vividly. You always actually referred to French philosophers and poets, and we talked French at that time. And uh, I would like to congratulate you on your French. But now we have moved on. I find in your new role as federal minister, I think you also worked as an interpreter. And I think you're well qualified. You also speak Arabic. And that uh, you, as a minister of foreign affairs, actually um, are saying, you know, the word is a little bit out of balance, and what is needed now is uh, actually great skills. I saw this also with the foreign minister in Germany who once said, uh, this word has come off the hinges, and 
you, in your case, with the languages you speak, you only actually mentioned Libya, but what about the um, countries on the other side of the Sahel? Um, they uh, have the resources. Uh, there are many, many possibilities there. And their know-how is one matter, but resources is quite another. And you have to think back to colonial times and the history of colonialism. But by colonial times, we are no longer know where um, what happened in the past. We don't know about our history and how people live. This means give us a chance by education to achieve another level. Another example, if you don't give us to eat, then you, this is not necessarily what we need, this kind of support. We can do this ourselves. We can produce in our countries. But in order to achieve this, um, you have to revise your politics in Europe because um, we need to put agriculture onto a different basis so as to not have people starve. And we heard here that even in Austria, um, um, about what's happening. So why shouldn't people try to come to Europe? We hear about Europe and the life there and also about Austria. And so uh, actually it's time that you would say, well, if you actually set different priorities for Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, I think it's high time to do something about it. Um, and it would be great if Vienna took an initiative. I would see this as a great task. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for describing the situation. This is what it's like. I support it. And I have also pointed out in the Migration Department we cannot actually um, reduce ourselves to an EU Marshall Plan for Africa. This does not really work because the Marshall Plan was designed for industrialized countries who had um, an administration that could support this plan. Uh, I think a Marshall Plan would be the wrong thing to do. In simple terms, I don't know Sub-Saharan Africa as well as you know it and some other people know it. But in my opinion, it's about the changed EU trade policy. Um, it is about um, the fact, for example, in front of the West African coast, are there tuna fishers um, who work there? Uh, now Tunisian grapes uh, are um, uh, allowed to be exported. This was a big topic. And uh, of course, with all the uh, changes that were made and the closing to African products from grapes to, uh, to other products, this was the wrong approach. I, I um, agree with this. This was the wrong thing to do. There were some misjudgments and wrong developments that were started. Um, there are reasons for that. But uh, we actually uh, had many agricultural markets in Africa that were damaged as a result. And the European Union, uh, this is not my field, but um, I actually um, address it, especially when we talk about cooperation and develop in uh, development and development aid, because then it comes into the uh, topic. And in my opinion, it's important to maintain basic supplies, basic water supply, basic electricity supply, um, agricultural um, um, uh, mainstay. This needs to be guaranteed because people will start to migrate if these basic supplies are not guaranteed. But all the other points is a question of trade policy on the same level. And here, of course, the topics are different. It's not about creating markets. And another momentum that I would like to address, I've seen it again and again, that it's not only true for the African continent, it starts in Southeastern Europe, is the question, who is my vis-a-vis? -vis? Who is on the other end, uh, at the other side of the table when it comes to administration? I come from administration. I know what the Austrian administrative system does. 
And um, it is the backbone of all political decisions and implementation of these decisions. And if I don't have an administration that is efficient, that cannot be corrupted, cannot be bribed, uh, that doesn't have the capacities in order to implement and enforce uh, political uh, will. This is true for all sectors, health, education, you name it. Then the greatest ideas can remain in the books. Uh, this is something that we have tried time and again. And I myself had the opportunity to actually graduate from the École Nationale d'Administration, where I had colleagues also from African states, such as Mali and Burkina Faso. And uh, very often, these highly educated people were left in the lurch uh, and isolated. If the, when once they returned to their countries, you know that yourself. You need the right uh, setting. You need some allies, two, three, four allies, on the same level or um, above you, below you. As a single fighter in an administration, um, that you're going to go into internal uh, migration. <laughs> And therefore, I think this is a very, very important momentum. The administrative structures that uh, um, actually work uh, in an uncorrupted way where people make a love so they don't have to drive a taxi at night. Um, and this is something that is a decisive factor and needs to be paid attention to. And I personal don't like the term Marshall Plan because it is not the right one to you. Uh, our um, policy in the EU actually needs to be a different one. And it's important to set up efficient um, administrations. Uh, this is something that is not actually um, on people's minds every day. But you have China, you have Singapore, you have India, you have United Arab Emirates, who as actors have actually been quite out there, also Turkey. And to the extent how the Turkish economy provides the backwind, it will actually ha be become more active in on the African continent along with the others. And these are all elements that we have to keep in mind in the back of our minds. And I try within the framework of what I'm doing to be pragmatic about this. I'm not going to uh, dismantle the structure of a world that has become unhinged. Uh, I said this already twice, and I can say that the world cannot be saved. Uh, I'm not one of those who think that I'm, my task is to save the world. But within a certain radius, you um, can stay decent and become effective and um, do uh, what you can do following a set of priorities. Next question. Thank you. Uh, please briefly say uh, where you come from, country, name and country maybe. Prawada Patsik from Poland. Uh, Very interesting brief. Uh, I found three important, from my perspective, points. First is Turkey, Russia, and Asia. I understood that is your future aim as uh, your interest in your future work. Uh, what do you think about uh, future strategy? the strategy for Europe, the strategy for your country, uh, directed to Russia, because we observe everybody what is going on in Russia, in China, in United States, and Russia as a very important player. Uh, we are talking a lot today about Russia, about the hybrid warfare, about many issues. What is your point of view? Uh, what is your strategy as a proposal for our audience. Mm -hmm. Danke sehr. Uh, ja, ich darf auch hier wieder auf die I would like to refer to strategy and the historical aspects, as Martin Kluck once stated this, Russia is a part of Europe. Uh, even if President van der Bellen, uh, as at the, uh, he said this at uh, Putin's visit, we must 
live with Russia as a partner and have to work together with them. And I would like to add, it's one of our priorities to see Russia as a partner, a partner in in view of Syria. Uh, also, when it is about uh, the uh, Iran nuclear crisis, we have cons consider Russia a partner and act with them together uh, in Iran. And I see Russia also as a partner, not only in fighting terrorism. Um, uh, Russia wanted to be a partner after 9-11. This changed a little then because um, uh, with the Iraq situation, uh, Russia did not follow suit. And third point I would like to add, and Russia can also be a partner in migration questions. So there are many, many areas, many reasons why uh, for geographical reasons, for historical reasons, and for practical reasons, we would like to work together with Russia, and we should work together with Russia. Thank you very much. Next question. Manuela Krugov from Theodarmstadt, Germany. Thank you for your very, very interesting lecture that has uh, dealt with diplomacy in a very interesting way and has given us great insights. And I do have a question. Is the independency of diplomats uh, actually limited by um, leadership instruments and do you actually feel controlled by them? We talked about the four terms. Brigitte Peichel um, actually uh, gave them as the overall theme for this conference and as Emmanuel Macron uh, actually said, it could, can we only fully recognize and see ourselves once we see ourselves with the eyes of the other party? of the opponent. Once as a child, I actually heard this Indian saying, before you judge somebody else, um, actually walk in his moccasins for um, a full moon month. And I re somehow remember this. I don't know when I heard it. But to actually step into the shoes of somebody else, um, uh, we are all driven. We have our socialization in one way or another and have made our personal experiences, and this is the way we are. But if we succeed for a short moment to see the world from the viewpoint of another person to really um, step into their shoes. I actually, you you learn a lot. And it's not just about the vocabulary. All languages open a new world. Every language creates its own world. It helps us to understand the other person. There's a different access to poetry, to literature, and the same with music. So without the French chanson, I would not personally be the person I am today. I needed like a good piece of chocolate. And uh, these are all aspects that make us ourselves. And I do believe that again and again there is time and space, whether it's the experts or the diplomats uh, or the teachers. I think it's also um, very important to have lecturers and teachers, not just university professors, who um, actually go somewhere else as guest teachers in order to uh, get to know a culture and all so then be able to bring this culture closer to others. And um, we have learned all a lot um, uh, by this kind of exchange. I grew up with Ann and Pat. This is an English book that was used for a long time to teach English uh, in Austria to kids in school. And um, where you learn how to take the bus and buy a bus ticket. But this is what we grew up with. It's a view to another world. And I think it's decisive. And it's decisive that we actually access a culture via language. During my time in Iran, I actually also studied a little bit of Chinese 
um, uh, just to uh, uh, like opening a door a little. Um, and just by this immersion, I understood a few things um, about why is a word uh, in Mandarin like this. And this is fascinating when you learn a new language. And therefore, I'm a um, supporter of um, um, multi-language uh, um, education. And unfortunately, what's happening today is that we actually um, speak fewer languages and uh, I'm very sorry that the British are leaving the European Union because now I can't say any longer could you say phrase this in English there are certain texts now that are actually have become uh, so hard to read and uh, it's um, it's creating confusion. So um, this is the loss of language and being um, out there without the language. I didn't quite get to your question about the leadership and control. Uh, this is now a re repetition of the question before. Unfortunately, no mic is being used. This was the question relating to leadership instruments. Uh, answer, I'm a little rigid. I'm not the one who lets others control me. Uh, I don't want to be limited. This is my approach. When I heard this the first time 20 years ago, I thought, huh, interesting. Maybe I'm also resilient because things just don't knock me out like that. But also being mindful, terms that have seen an inflationary use lately and sustainability, nobody can hear this any longer. So there is a certain dictatorship of language here, but you can fight against it. And uh, in the re last seven months, I have often actually uh, turned down things that were presented to me for a speech and I just didn't say them and I did fairly well because I realized that um, sometimes this woke up people because I used different terms and not the, the, the catchphrases that everybody uses. I think you have to stand your ground and sometimes say no and just not do what everybody else does. Things become more interesting this way. And uh, there, all the rest uh, follows suit, and it's question of personal freedom, I would say. And if you stay free on the inside internally, I'm not going to be controlled by certain terms and certain concepts, then I think you can start a so-called counter-language and uh, bring it out into the open. Of course, it's easier now, but 20 years ago, too, when I was a tiny, tiny diplomat, I also was revolting and made this on a regular basis. And I certainly did this as a freelancer. And I again and again paid a high price for it. I must also mention that I was marginalized at times, but I had no problem with that. Thank you. Last question now. Um, Thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, you yeah. mentioned that you are taking the chairmanship of the European Union on Sunday. Yes. Uh, could you please elaborate a bit where Austria stands on European common and uh, security and defense policy? Because things are obviously moving at the moment. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Danke zunächst für das nette Echo. Uh, vielen Dank für Ihr Kompliment. Thank you for your compliment, sir. I'm going to answer in German because there's very good translation. Thank you. Um, Great job to the interpreters. On Monday, we actually had the Council of the Foreign Ministers and we were talking about this. Austria, I must say, at the moment is in a rather difficult situation that we are on the sidelines. 
uh, we get information, but I feel it as a foreign minister that in the information floor we are not fully integrated because it is in the partnership. We're not tied into the Partnership for Peace since the Warsaw Summit in 2016. And I actually on Monday asked my colleagues and I appealed to them, uh, you know what you have with the Austrian military, and I would like to ask you that Austria is reintegrated into Partnership for Peace. I'm working on the veto side on the level of the foreign ministry, but we also have to do a few things on our side. I got a few informa uh, information from the Turkey side, but we are in a multilateral situation of a quid pro quo. This is one point. The other point is that we have an interest uh, to be a counterweight. Uh, it's a question of emancipation also. I don't have all the insights here that some of you hear regarding transatlantic and EU operationability. And I hope that here there will be an increased approach, an enhanced approach, um, also with view to Brexit. Great Britain very often was the voice that didn't push ahead. And we feel that geopolitically there is a vacuum. We feel it with France in the discussion. And uh, France has lots of ideas, makes many proposals. And um, this initiative that was presented, I don't know exactly what it's called, the crisis initiative um, uh, by the French. So France is. Um, actually stepping into this uh, leadership role again and uh, our part and our role in the EU um, uh, presidency is going to be that we want to set up operational um, um, elements to provide continuity also in view of the Brexit uh, and Great Britain leaving and in view of the changes as to who is providing uh, the ideas and which ideas are going to get enforced. I know that there are many, many interesting ideas that have emerged here in this very uh, building. And my uh, colleague Mario Kunasek, uh, the Minister of Defense, is also a uh, part of this. And um, he, of course, will also promote the interest to develop a European security and defense policy and that it will be taken seriously. Thank you. There is another gentleman. Minister, you talked about Renaud Arnaud and Clausewitz, and this morning we had a panel where we discussed our concepts. And Goethe, the poet that we have in common, so only have only if you have concepts you can lead. But in Germany, we have a foreign minister who always said that we don't need any military, but we need political solutions. He probably referred to diplomatic solutions. So he mixed up all the different concepts. And the two forces, the diplomatic and the military forces, were, are not in balance. How do you see that? Well, I'll try to answer it. I'm not saying that I always succeed, but every morning when I get up and I've slept a lot, I like to use clear language and clear thinking because I'm saying that nonverbal interaction is what animals are really good at. I live with a lot of pets and they are masters in nonverbal communication. I also learn a lot from them, but language is the instrument, the tool that we have available to communicate. So that is the big difference. And this tool, our language, should be used with precision. Because if a carpenter is not precise, then the table won't fit. And if we don't use our language precisely enough, then confusion can be created. And this confuse, confusion exists. It starts with uh, language continues with translation, and it ends with a very banal 
and weakened form of English. So this uh, common denominator of uh, well, this technical English, well, that level is quite regrettable. And maybe this is my own deformation professionnelle because uh, I used to work as a teacher, so I'm maybe marked by well, this uh, idea of always wanting to prove things. But I said that uh, letters need to be written differently and uh, certain texts need to change. I don't like too much with the concept of challenge. I hate the term challenge. So simply can't stand it. And I think people now know that I don't like that term. And I am asking these terms to be replaced by something more apt. And I think that we need to, well, use language in a precise way. That's what I'm trying to do on a daily basis, and I'm seeing how imprecise it sometimes is, and that's regrettable because the masters of nonverbal communication are the four-legged ones, and we should uh, properly deal with verbal communication and master it. Uwe Hartmann from Germany, from the Bundeswehr, the German Armed Forces. I have rarely heard such an intellectual presentation from a minister, so congratulations. But now comes my tricky question. This morning we heard from Klaus von Rosen that strategy formation has something to do with research and learning. How do you organize this in your ministry? I think what I heard was that it's not always so simple. And where do you get your strategic advice from? Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank you for this wonderful echo. Well, I'm in a fortunate position that in the past 30 years of my life, uh, I read a lot. I spent a lot of time reading, and what I miss is writing. And in the past, I used to spend one afternoon per week in the library. And that's something that I can still, uh, well, use today. I'm betting on my colleagues. I don't have any PR agency or communications advisor or coach or whatever. In the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we have really excellent people. And the question comes up time and again where the talent is slumbering. A lot of colleagues are now telling me that uh, all of a sudden they're discovering other colleagues whom I brought from this inner exile. And I'm in a privileged situation, of course, because I myself uh, left 30 years ago because, well, I simply had enough. And now I'm back, and I know a lot of people, and I know what they can do and where they can be used. And these people, in turn, know others. So we are using our own treasure chest. It starts with mines and ends with furniture. So we are not buying anything new or renting anything. It's all homemade. and. I always try to find the time. I'm not always successful, but I'm not somebody who does a lot in the evening. I prefer going for a walk with my dog, so go riding on horseback. But well, I continue to read a lot. Robert Harris' trilogy about Cicero, that's really incredible, uh, very edifying. And I always found in meetings in Belgrade, I had a meeting a couple of months ago, this was an incredibly difficult situation. Everybody's really nervous because of the Kosovo. So would you have thought that I could have talked about EU projects? We talked about Ivo Andrich and other authors whom I fortunately remembered. Milis Czernianski, I read him many years ago, Siopet, the Serb national poet of the 20th century. We only talked about poetry and thus the right atmosphere was created. So I still depend on what I did in the past because in such situations uh, you are steering, of course, uh, blind. You can't prepare for that. But I have a fine little office with wonderful colleagues who all have good ideas and I've also 
get a lot of talent from our own ministry and I try to read the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, the NZZ, and also look at some other interesting publications, but that is manageable. And therefore, thank you for the fine compliment. But it is very edifying to have the privilege of having a conversation where, well, the spark is conveyed and uh, you are feeling that you're on the same wavelength with somebody. And then you meet at a certain spiritual level that is good for the soul and hopefully in the final analysis this is also good for relations. But it's an undeniable fact that uh, our culture of having conversations at the level of the European Union has largely been lost. And in my field, I will try to pep up this debate, to stimulate the debate. That's uh, my concern. And this is why I believe that from time to time you can be provocative uh, if you have the right intellectual and political tools and arguments. Thank you very much, dear Minister. As customary, all of our speakers get a little gift. We have this conference wine, the Strategos wine, and I would like to hand over a bottle of this wine. That's very kind, a conference wine, okay. We will now Receipt for lunch and at uh, 10 past 1 we will continue. Thank you.